Today's episode of the Acoustic Tuesday Show is all about Tony Rice. Yes, we're gonna play a new game called The Six Degrees of Tony Rice. I'm still not quite sure how what the rules are or how it's gonna work, but we're just gonna dive right in. So here's the deal. We're gonna be looking at six of Tony Rice's influences. And you'd think I'd just be listing off a ton of bluegrass guitar players, but that couldn't be any further from the truth. Why? Well, because Tony Rice was influenced by a hefty dose of amazing singer-songwriters, and that's exactly who we'll be looking at. Now, it's no doubt that Tony Rice was an amazing bluegrass guitar player, and for, for just getting everybody on the same page, if you're curious about Tony Rice, or if you're kind of half interested in bluegrass guitar, Tony Rice is your starting point. He will lead you down the rabbit hole that is bluegrass guitar. So just let me put that out there right off the front of the episode. In fact, our very first influence of Tony Rice, the sixth degree of Tony Rice, is really more of a bluegrass guitar player than a singer-songwriter, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Tony Rice was heftily influenced by none other than Clarence White. Yes, Clarence White. Well, from his flat picking to his actual guitar, Tony Rice was influenced heavily by Clarence White. In fact, Tony Rice later became the owner of Clarence White's 1935 Martin D28 with enlarged sound hole. In fact, you're gonna learn a hell of a lot more about that later on today's episode. But if you're not sure who, to or who Clarence White was, well, he was a member of the Kentucky Colonels with his brother. He was also a member of the Birds, yeah, the Birds, that band. Uh, but he also was a session player, and he recorded on albums uh, by the likes of Everly Brothers, The Monkees, Joe Cocker, Randy Newman, Linda Ronstadt, Arlo Guthrie, and even Jackson Brown, and, and so many more. So he was quite the influential guitar player, not just to Tony Rice, but definitely to Tony Rice. Uh, so if you're curious of who Clarence White is or how he sounded, here's a quick take of the song Pick and Flat on Tut Taylor's album Dobro Country, where you can hear Clarence White's guitar break. Here it is. Moving down our list to the fifth degree of Tony Rice, I'm gonna cite Tom Paxton. Yes, Tom Paxton is the fifth degree of Tony Rice because of his songwriting influence. Tom Paxton was kind of leading the charge. Uh, he was originally born in Chicago, uh, ended up in New York, frequented the Gaslight Cafe, and kind of was one of those 60s, 70s folk artists, kind of part of the folk boom. Now, he's had an over 50-year career and continues making music to this day, and he influenced Tony Rice in a big way. In fact, to the degree that Tony Rice actually covered his song, The Last Thing on My Mind, on his 1983 album, Church Street Blues, which in my opinion is one of the best Tony Rice albums available. Yes, one of the best, if not the best, Tony Rice album available today. From the acoustic tone, to the song selection, to the way he plays, that album is probably my personal Desert Island album. Now you'd think, okay, well we're talking about Tom Paxton, let's listen to Tom Paxton play. Well, unfortunately, because of YouTube copyright, we can't. And then you'd think, well, we can at least hear Tony Rice's version. Well, because of YouTube copyright, we can't, but we can make another leap, which is what makes this game really fun. We're actually gonna listen to another bluegrass guitarist, Doc Watson, and his son, Merle Watson, play the Tom Paxton tune, song, tune, soon, uh, the song, Last Thing On My Mind. Here it is. Wow. 
Earl was such a great guitar picker, such a great finger picker, but I digress. What a great version of that song. Now, don't worry, Guitar Geek, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. If you visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT136, you'll be able to see the actual Tony Rice versions of these songs because I'll pull them and put them on that website. Now, continuing on down our list, we're gonna move on to the fourth degree of influence uh, that Tony Rice had, and that is none other than American-born songwriter Jim Croce. Yes, the man with the most powerful mustache. Look at that thing. It is it is quite the mustache. Uh, but Jim Croce was a huge influence to Tony Rice. In fact, let me just back up a degree. Something was brought to my attention. Uh, influence number six, Clarence White. Influence number five, Tom Paxton. And now influence number four, Jim Croce, were all born in the United States. In fact, this is the United States contingent of Tony Rice influences. The latter contingent are all Canadian-born singer-songwriters. We'll get there in a second. Bear with me here. Yes, we're talking about Jim Croce and yes, that powerful mustache. Back in 1994, Tony Rice covered the song Age on the Bluegrass Album Band Volume 4. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Bluegrass Album Band, I think there's five in total albums of the Bluegrass Album Band out, and you have to get all of them, because it is a collection of, it's kind of the canon of bluegrass traditional songs played by some of, well, if not the top bluegrass players of the time. We're talking an incredible collection of music, and yes, Tony Rice covered the song Age on that 1994 Bluegrass Album Band album, and let's go ahead and listen to not Tony Rice play the song Age. We're not even gonna listen to the song Age, but we are gonna listen to a Jim Croce song. I'm gonna introduce you to another guitar picker, one that I happen to really enjoy. He has a custom Martin D35. His name is Seth Avett of the Avett Brothers. Here he is playing with Bob Crawford the song Operator, a Jim Croce classic. Here it is. Operator, oh, would you help me place this call? You see the number on the matchbook is old and faded. She's living in L.A. with my best old ex-friend, Ray. I guess she said that she knew well and sometimes hated. Isn't that the way they say it goes? Well, let's forget all that And give me the number if you can find it So I can call just to tell them I'm fine And the show I've overcome the blow I've learned to take it well I only wish my words would just convince myself That it just isn't real But that's not the way it feels Well, I certainly hope you heard that song, and I hope the powers uh, that be at YouTube allowed us to include that song. But if you didn't happen to hear it, if we had to cut it out of the show, please visit AcousticLife.tv forward slash AT136 to hear that gem. Because I, I gotta say, I just picture it, this, this beautiful moment backstage where the two are playing that song. It's just, it's one of those candid moments that I love. Now you're thinking, three degrees of Tony Rice remain. Yes, we're gonna get to those degrees, but first I wanna welcome you to the Acoustic Tuesday show. And when we come back from this little break, we're gonna dive into those three degrees, the uh, quote unquote Canadian contingent. That's all coming up right after this. I'm Tony Castro, and this is the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Guitar geeks, unite. Welcome to Acoustic Tuesday, episode number 136. This is the show where you're gonna discover acoustic guitar gear, learn about acoustic artists, and get inspired to live your very best acoustic life. As with all episodes of Acoustic Tuesday, I'm gonna dive into my guitar geek list for the week. And yes, this, this week, the guitar geek list starts with Tony Rice and his six degrees of singer-songwriting influence. And I say we just move right into the Canadian contingent. Yes, we're gonna go to the Great White North for these next three degrees, and we're gonna kick things off with one of the most celebrated Canadian songwriters of all time. I'm talking about Ian Tyson. Ian Tyson is a huge influence to Tony Rice. In fact, Tony Rice covered his song, Summer Wages, not once, but two times. He covered it in 1992 on his album, Native American, which is a fantastic album with a bunch of covers. We'll get to that in a second. He also covered it back in 1975 when he was playing with J.D. Crow in the New South on their self-titled album, which if you don't own it, you need it. 
Bottom line, it is one of the best bluegrass albums of all time. I know I said Church Street Blues is amazing, but that was Tony Rice solo. I'm talking about bluegrass album. I'm talking about a band. This is what you need to own because holy smokes, we're talking Bobby Sloan on bass, Ricky Skaggs, J.D. Crow on banjo, and of course, Tony Rice on vocals and guitar. <laughs> totally mind blowing. Now, you're thinking, Tone, you've taken quite a few leaps on this, this Six Degrees of Tony Rice so far, and I'm gonna take probably the biggest leap I've taken thus far. So we know that Ian Tyson influenced Tony Rice. We know that Tony Rice covered Ian Tyson's Summer Wages. Well, I can't feature either of those tunes or either of those versions, but I can feature an Ian Tyson song played by Jerry Jeff Walker. I know, it's a big leap, but bear with me here. It's one of my favorite Ian Tyson songs of all time because of the imagery and because, well, I think it's just lyrical magic. The song is entitled Navajo Rug, and here is Jerry Jeff Walker and his band playing it. It's two eggs up on whiskey toast, home drives on the side. You wash her down with the roadhouse coffee that burns up your inside. Just a canyon color at a dinner, a waitress I did love. We sat in the back beneath an old stuff there, a worn out never old run. Aye, 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 Katie, shades of red and blue. Aye, 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 Katie, whatever became of the never old rug and you. My favorite line from that song. Roadhouse coffee that burns up your insides. We've all had it, we've all loved it. And I just think that's just a wonderful statement. So there you have it, Ian Tyson's song, Navajo Rug, played by Jerry Jeff Walker. Let's move on to the second degree of Tony Rice. Now this is one you've likely heard of before. This gal, this woman, this prolific songwriter is from Canada and I guarantee you, well, She's probably one of your favorite because she was one of Tony Rice's favorites as well. I'm talking about Joni Mitchell. Yes, Joni Mitchell. In fact, Tony Rice covered Joni Mitchell's song, Urge for Going, on his 1992 album, Native American. And he did a fantastic job. I cannot feature that song. I cannot feature Joni Mitchell's song, but I can feature a version of that very song done by another folk singer great. Remember way back when we talked about Tom Paxton visiting the Gaslight Cafe, which was a cafe in Greenwich Village, uh, New York, and it was booming in the 60s, 70s, kind of right alongside that folk boom. Well, this next performer, Dave Van Ronk, frequented the Gaslight Cafe. He happened to cover this Joni Mitchell song, Urge for Going. I thought it was a great tie into Tony Rice. Nonetheless, we're continuing to make up the rules on the six degrees of Tony Rice here. Here is Dave Van Ronk playing Joni Mitchell's song, Urge for Going. The warriors of winter give a cold, triumphant shout. And all that stays is dying, all that lives is getting out. You see the geese in chevron flight, straining and flapping on before the snow. For going, and they've got the wings to go. Yes, they get the urge for going when meadow grass is turning brown, and summertime is falling down, and winter closing in. So here we find ourselves coming up on the first degree of Tony Rice, and you've been handed just a, a complete, well, a downright, a bushel basket full of artists to check out. And that's gonna continue on today's show, but I should let you in on a little bit of a secret. I'm kicking off a new segment this on this week's Acoustic Tuesday show, and that's coming up very shortly. And we're gonna wrap up today's show with an exercise. I'm gonna walk you through an exercise that will be your key. It will be a keystone in your guitar journey so that you actually set goals and achieve them. So that's coming up. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a tease of what's coming up before we got to the first degree of influence on Tony Rice. And we're going to just go ahead and dive right into that influence right now. Yes, the first degree of Tony Rice is none other than Canadian great Gordon Lightfoot, the 12 string slinger. Yes, he played one of those old Gibson 12 strings. In fact, I believe he still does, but holy smokes, can this guy write a song? In fact, I will say this. I think Gordon Lightfoot led the charge in Canada during the 60s and 70s folk boom. In fact, I'm not gonna just limit that to Canada because he certainly had an influence on the States as well. 
In fact, when uh, when Whitney got some records from her mother uh, to add to our record collection, I would say 80%, roughly 80% of those records were Gordon Lightfoot albums. Uh, so I would say he, he definitely played a huge part in the States as well. But nonetheless, uh, Tony Rice drew great influence from Gordon Lightfoot. In fact, he covered many of his songs. He covered uh, the record of the album Edmund Fitzgerald, I'm Not Saying, and Early Morning Rain. Those were just three of my favorites. Now, that's not all that Tony Rice covered. In fact, Tony Rice dedicated an entire compilation album to Gordon Lightfoot. What's the title of the album? Well, it's Tony Rice Sings Gordon Lightfoot. And it's, I believe, 12 tracks of Tony Rice covering Gordon Lightfoot. I believe Tony Rice was a huge Gordon Lightfoot fan, and this was a great way for him to pay homage. Now, you're thinking to yourself, all right, Tone, I'm ready for the leap. Well, I'm about to take you on a journey, okay? This is a big journey, so I'm gonna do my best. Uh, we're gonna go well over six degrees of separation here. So we've got Tony Rice being influenced by Gordon Lightfoot. Gordon, Life being in, Gordon Lightfoot influencing many other songwriters. In fact, he, he was covered by a ton of different songwriters. Uh, one of my favorites, one of my favorite performers, Billy Bragg and Joe Henry. Now, Billy Bragg, uh, also covered a Woody Guthrie tune, and Woody Guthrie was a huge influence to none other than Tom Paxton, Dave Van Ronk, artists we've mentioned thus far. So I think this is a full circle moment. I know I'm drawing at straws here, but holy smokes, folks, I think I think we're making lots of degrees connect right now, and I, I'd like to think that as a community, we're gonna continue to make those degrees connect. I digress, let me get back to the point at hand. We're talking about Gordon Lightfoot, and one of the fantastic covers that I found that I was able to include on the show was by none other than Billy Bragg and Joe Henry off of a great compilation album that they did of field recordings. And here they are covering the song, Early Morning Rain. In the early morning rain With a dollar in my And an aching in my heart And my pockets full of sand I'm a long way from home And I miss my loved ones so In the early morning Thus concludes the six degrees of Tony Rice. Now I've taken you on a twisted road full of detours, full of potholes, full of hurdles, but we've taken quite the musical journey together. It's been a long one, so let me just give you a quick recap of the six degrees of Tony Rice. Coming in at number six, we've got Clarence White, fantastic bluegrass guitarist, and Tony Rice owns his old 1935 Martin D28. Moving on to number five, we've got Tom Paxton, one of my favorite folk singer-songwriters and a huge influence on Tony Rice, no doubt. Then we move on to Jim Croce coming in at the number four position, also known for his songwriting, but look at that mustache. It's pretty profound in and of itself. Then we have number three, Ian Tyson, Canadian singer-songwriter and writer of some great songs, including Someday Soon. Moving on to number two, none other than Joni Mitchell, queen of alternate tunings, queen of songwriting, and just overall queen of music. And then we move on to the first degree of Tony Rice. Yes, Gordon Lightfoot, that curly-haired fella that played the 12 string and wrote some incredible songs, most of which Tony Rice actually covered. Now you're thinking, you might be, you might be yelling at your screen right now saying, Tony, I can't believe you left off <gasps> fill in the blank. Well, if I left off any influence or if I missed any connection, please put it in the comments below. I'd love to compile a wonderful list of Tony Rice's influences so that somebody maybe first getting into Tony Rice could see who influenced him and also could take that musical journey along with us guitar geeks here at the Acoustic Tuesday Show. So please, in the comments below, let me know some other influences that Tony Rice may have, uh, may have paid tribute to 
And uh, of course, again, if I missed any connections, you can leave that there as well. All right, so you've already found out the six degrees of Tony Rice, according to, well, Tony Policastro. Tonys, us Tonys, we stick together. Uh, coming up on today's Acoustic Tuesday show, we're gonna head down to Vegas and hear from Brendan at Heartbreaker Guitars. I'm also gonna introduce to you a new segment on the Acoustic Tuesday show, one that you can actually participate in, and I'll share with you all the details on that. And we're gonna wrap up the show with a definitive way that you can not only measure your progress, but also set goals on your guitar journey that you will actually achieve. That's all coming up, but before we dig into that, we should take a quick detour, since we're already doing so, and dig into a little bit of Guitar Geek Trivia. Yes, I have to announce your Guitar Geek Trivia question, and who's the subject of that Guitar Geek Trivia question? Well, it's none other than Tony Rice, and more specifically, his exact guitar, and when he became the owner. So here is your Guitar Geek Trivia question. In which year did Tony Rice become the owner of the now infamous 1935 Martin D28 that had once been owned by Clarence White? Was it A, 1958, B, 1964, C, 1968, or D, 1975? Go ahead and ponder that question. At the end of the show, I'll not only give you the answer, I'm also gonna give you the story of how Tony Rice acquired this guitar, and it is quite the tale. A tale of mythical proportions. In fact, I believe it goes down in the Guitar Geek canon of mythology. That's how important this story is, and you're not gonna wanna miss those details, but we can't do that till the end of the show. So just go ahead and think about your answer and uh, commit to it, and then uh, at the end, you'll figure out if you got it right or wrong. You could take bets, take wagers with your fellow guitar geeks. I don't know, you could turn it into a gambling game. I'm not endorsing gambling. I'm not endorsing gambling. I shouldn't have said that out loud, but if you wanna do that, I won't tell anybody. Moving right along. One of the things that I love about guitar is the opportunities that it presents us with. The situations that because of the guitar, we find ourselves in these amazing situations and it's like, I, the reason I'm in these situations, the reason I know these people, the reason I've made friends is because of the guitar. An inanimate object made of wood, six strings, just sits there in the corner, but man, it certainly holds this amazing emotional power. I think the guitar is one of the most powerful inanimate objects that exists in the world. In fact, I'm willing to double down on that statement, talking about gambling, which is why I wanna introduce a new segment on the Acoustic Tuesday show to you and it's called Guitar Gratitude. A chance for guitar geeks to, well, wax a little bit poetic, get ph philosophical, get introspective, and thank the guitar. Essentially announce why they're grateful the guitar is in their lives, why they're grateful for a certain scenario that the guitar has presented them with. And to kick off this segment, I decided to, well, sit down and record my guitar gratitude. Well, I didn't sit down, I actually stood on my back deck, but you get the idea. So let me uh, whisk you away to my house in Bozeman where I'm about to share with you my guitar gratitude. Here it is. I wanted to kick this guitar gratitude segment off and share some of my personal guitar gratitude. And my guitar gratitude centers around how the guitar has brought me and my dad much closer. Now, my dad and I have always been really close, but when the guitar entered the picture, we had this bond. We still do have this bond, and it's pretty darn amazing. And it all started when he first brought the guitar out of the crawl space. I was 18 years old. I had no clue what the hell I was doing with my life. He showed me a few things, and that really ignited the fire. Fast forward and years, years later, uh, we continued to play and things uh, whenever we'd have family get togethers and whatnot. But one of the moments that really sticks out for me is, um, well, a couple years ago, my folks were in a, a pretty bad motorcycle accident and I went to visit them at the hospital and actually brought my guitar. And it was that moment that I had extreme gratitude for the guitar because as I sat and sang and my dad was singing harmony with me um, from the hospital bed, it was a pretty special moment. And I think it all zoomed into really quick focus that the guitar really holds a special power and certainly continues to bring me and my father closer. So I'm very grateful for my guitar and for what it's done for, well, me, my dad, and really my whole family. So I know you as a guitar geek likely have, well, some guitar gratitude that you probably wanna share. And I want you to participate in this segment. But before I tell you the details, let's look at a couple more guitar gratitude seg uh, 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 clips actually submitted by, well, fellow guitar geeks. For this next one, we're gonna head to Minnesota and hear what Brian S. is grateful for in his guitar journey. Here he is. 
Hi folks, Brian here. How does my acoustic guitar help me? Well, it brings me great joy and it gives me purpose. I play it, I pray with it, I learn from it, and I have made great new friends because of it. I started learning to play the guitar way back in 1972, and ever since, being a guitar player has been a big part of what defines me. Since joining Tony's Acoustic Challenge, I've learned to play more than just open chords. I've gained tons of confidence, and I've turned into a real guitar geek, acquiring four more awesome guitars, plus a ukulele, a banjo, and a mandolin. Still got to learn those. My wife scratches her head at how obsessed I am, but she knows the joy it brings me, and I really do appreciate that. Thanks, Tony Policastro and crew. You are making my guitar journey a very fun ride. Guitar geeks, unite. Having met Brian at the Acoustic Life Festival and seeing that brings me great joy. Um, just Brian is an awesome guitar geek, a great player, and, and he is the type of guitar geek that just wants nothing more than to lift up his fellow guitar geeks, encourage them, support them. And he has grown in his guitar journey as well. In fact, uh, I just want to say a huge thanks, Brian, for submitting that video and also including your collection of ALFs in the background. Not one, not two, not three, but four Alfs. I only got one back there, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty. I'm, I'm feeling like I need to really beef up my collection of Alfs. I digress. That's not the point of the segment. Uh, bottom line: Thank you, Brian, for submitting that guitar gratitude, and it's really cool because, well, we kicked off the guitar gratitude. Uh, talk about six degrees. I'm gonna just play the game right now. We kicked off the guitar gratitude segment. I shared a little bit of personal, uh, personal story of mine. Well, I actually lived in Minnesota for a time which we went to Minnesota for Brian's gratitude. Uh, and then now we're gonna go to Oshawa. We're up in Canada, the Great White North, a, a place I'm fascinated with. Uh, we checked out some singer-songwriters from Canada today, and holy smokes, I think it's all coming together, folks. All the degrees. There's so many degrees right now, they're just flying around, I can't even control all the degrees. Let's head up to Oshawa, Canada, and check out Jim K, well, Jim Cross's uh, guitar gratitude. Here he is. Hey, Tony. It's Jim from sunny Oshawa. Good to hear from everybody. I hope everybody in the TAC family is uh, healthy and well. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but we, as of this morning, we're under a state of emergency and we're under self-isolation for 14 days trying to stop this, this crazy virus. Brings uh, the meaning of uh, guitar gratitude right to the forefront. Uh, without my TAC family, um, this little baby thanks attack and my music, I don't know where I'd be at right now. It keeps me sane, it keeps me grounded, uh, keeps my head clear and all the craziness of my day-to-day -day business, and I don't know where I'd be without you guys. Uh, it's also allowed me to start playing live every week at local open mics, and I don't know what how to say thanks. Everybody, be well. Huge thanks to Jim Cross for submitting that guitar gratitude and sharing that with us. Jim uh, is another guitar geek that I've had the chance to meet in person at an Acoustic Life Festival. Found out he's a goalie, found out he's a Canadian. I mean, all of the connections, all the degrees continue to line up. I mean, talk about stars aligning. Well, this is where I ask for your help because I want you to participate in the guitar gratitude segment. Just like the folks that you saw just now, they've shared something personal with us. They've gotten a little bit introspective and they've shared why they're grateful the guitar is a part of their life with all of us guitar geeks. And I think that's awesome and I want more because there is no time that's better than to be positive and share why we're grateful for the guitar than right now. We're inundated with negative news all the time, not just in this moment, but all the time. We wanna just take that negative news, set it aside, and focus on some of the positive things. Focus on the things we have control over, and that that is something that we guitar geeks are extremely, extremely lucky for because we can turn to the guitar in times of worry, in times of anxiousness, in times of nervousness, in times of just general concern, and the guitar can take us away to a magical place. So why are you grateful for the guitar? Why is the guitar such a major player in your life? I want you to submit your guitar gratitude at none other than guitargratitude.com. Go ahead and go there. It's gonna prompt you to record a video. You can do so from your computer or your phone. 
It takes only 60 seconds. You don't have to set up a fancy camera. It doesn't have to be the setup shot. The more candid, the better. The more enthusiastic, the better, because these guitar gratitude pieces are not only for a, a chance for self-reflection and introspection, but also a chance to inspire other guitar geeks to look at their guitar in a different way and share some gratitude. So please, again, submit that at guitargratitude.com. I would love to hear why you are grateful for the guitar. What's one thing that the guitar has brought into your life that you never saw coming? What's one person you'd like to thank? Maybe it was your first guitar teacher. Maybe it was that person at the guitar store that set you up with your very first guitar. Whoever you wanna thank, however you wanna express your gratitude, please do so at guitargratitude.com and I'll go ahead and feature you on an upcoming episode of Acoustic Tuesday. Now, so far the submissions have been crazy, so I'm trying to include as many as I possibly can. If I forget you, it doesn't mean that I have forgotten you, it just means that there's so many submissions that I can't feature them all, otherwise we'd have hour, 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 hour long Acoustic Tuesday shows and I, are, I already have a hard time trimming it up. So uh, please be brief in your submissions, again, 60 seconds or less and uh, submit those at guitargratitude.com. I'll not only feature you on the Acoustic Tuesday show, I'll be featuring some on Instagram as well, which we've just kind of re reinvigorated. Uh, and you can find us at Instagram on uh, uh, tac.guitar, I believe is our handle there. So make sure to check that out. I've been posting videos as well. So again, guitar gratitude. And of course, just to sign off on the guitar gratitude segment, I'm grateful for you, Guitar Geek, for watching the show, for sharing your Guitar Geek vibes with us and all the Guitar Geeks that watch watch Acoustic Tuesday on a weekly basis. Thank you. Thank you for being a guitar geek. And thank you for sharing your enthusiasm with all of us. Moving right along, some of us are, in fact, most of us are stuck at home lately, and it's really nice to get out of the house, but you know, a lot of us really can't. So I wanna take you on a virtual field trip. I want, to, I want you to come along with me down to Las Vegas where we can visit the Heartbreaker Guitars showroom and learn a little bit more about a guitar brand that has always fascinated me, a guitar brand that I really enjoy. In fact, you're gonna get a look at an innovation that this guitar brand has initiated that is pretty amazing. You're gonna see a cut up guitar neck and something I've never seen, the inside of a guitar neck with this incredible innovation from Furt Guitars. Yes, we're gonna head down to Heartbreaker Guitars in Vegas, check in with Brendan and he's gonna teach us all about Furt Guitars. And by the way, Toby is in rare form during this, this newscast, so make sure to keep an eye out for him. Here's Brendan. Thanks, Tony. Acoustic Tuesday geeks, Tony Polo Castro, welcome to the newscast from Heartbreaker Guitars. Guys, we've got a killer show for you today. Okay, today, Furch Guitars. Now, Furk has gone through a ton of changes over the last few years, okay? And one of the reasons the internet is on fire right now is because Furk guitars are just blowing up, okay? The reviews, um, the, the blogs, everybody is just raving about Furk guitars right now. Okay, first of all, Furk or Furch? Okay, a lot of us call it Furch, but back in the Czech Republic, they refer to it as Furk, but neither one is wrong. I asked Peter Furk, and that's what he said. So, okay. Furch Guitars, guys, what has changed in the last few years? First off, you're seeing the different color series, the rainbow series, and basically the way that works is the different colors represent the different specs. Like the red, for example, has Sitka Spruce over Indian Rosewood. Okay, the main difference that you're gonna see with Furch Guitars, okay, and this is the best news of all, okay, the price has dropped like 20%. Everybody was complaining, Tony, about how they could get Furch Guitars cheaper if they bought them through a European dealer. And what, what happened was, is they were using a North American third-party distributor, and basically that, along with some other things, kind of crept the price up higher than it should have been. Now, Furk Guitars is distributing directly to the U United States, okay? So the prices are down, the quality's the same, everything's the same, um, except, like I said, they, they are now using the, the rainbow colors, the, the red, the magenta, the green, all the different colors to represent the different specs. So let's take a closer look, Tony, at Furk Guitars. Okay, so Tony, we're gonna be talking about two models today. One is brand spanking new, it hasn't even been released yet, the Red Deluxe. And second, we're gonna go to kind of an obscure one, the Little Jane, which is the backpack size travel guitar, which is so cool because it actually breaks down and fits in a backpack. But before we jump into those, there's something really unique about Furk guitars that I wanted to show you guys. This is a neck for a Furk guitar, okay? Now, they've cut it out right here for demonstration purposes. So if you can zoom in on that, you'll see that there is a carbon fiber truss rod, incredibly stable, two-way adjustable truss rod in the neck. Now, what's this? 
This is an alloy neck brace is what they call it. And Tony, as you probably already know, a lot of guitars over time, one of the primary um, places that they, they often dip is right next to the neck. So what this basically does is it adds stability to that part of the neck. And because it, it also increases the rigidity of the neck, it increases sustain. So it actually has two functions. And uh, you know, I mean, leave it to FERC to just step up to the table and just you know, not be happy with the regular standard traditional building techniques of, uh, of creating a neck for a guitar. I mean, this thing, take a look at that. So anyway, you've got ultra, ultimate stability and you've got great sustain as a result of the neck design of the FERC guitars. This stuff is just amazing, guys. The first guitar on deck, which is not even released yet, is the Red Deluxe. Okay, this thing is insane, you guys. If you happen to be at the NAMM show, you might have seen it. But it's got a bevel in the traditional armrest position, and it's also got a bevel on the underside where the body of the guitar meets your body as the guitar sits in your lap. So it's got the ultimate comfort of the arm bevel, but it's also got, I, they don't call it a body bevel, they just call it dual bevel, but it is so cool. These guitars are gonna be released this summer, and wait till you see these things, guys. Absolutely incredible ingenuity from FERC guitars. The Red Deluxe, so look out for that. Okay, so everybody out there is making a travel size guitar these days, and FERC is no exception. Okay, what's the difference between the FERC and all the other travel guitars that are out there? This thing actually collapses and fits into a really cool backpack. Okay, so since the guitar is collapsible, your first concern is obviously, does it stay in tune? The answer is yes. The guys at FERC have done R&D on this guitar for about 10 years before it came out a few years back, and it stays in tune, which is very difficult to do. You've got all solid woods, that's a western red cedar top, over an African mahogany back and sides. It's got a cool little sound port right here, and um, other specs on the guitar, we've got a one and three quarter inch nut width, We've got a 24 and 3 16 scale length, and uh, I'm telling you guys, this thing stands up to all the travel size guitars over there, and it's better than most, in my opinion. The thing is awesome. So we're gonna take it to Mike for a quick test drive. So let's do that now. Mike, take it away. Man, thanks, Brendan. This is an amazing little guitar we got going on. Mike, that was great, thanks so much. Tony, Acoustic Tuesday Geeks, thank you guys for watching the newscast at Heartbreaker Guitars. I hope you learned a little something about FERC guitars. We're in love with these things. The quality, the tone, the craftsmanship, these things are insane. And guys, uh, this new one that's coming out, the Red Deluxe, I can't wait to see it. And when it arrives, we'll do a full review for you guys. So that was the Little Jane and the Red Deluxe, okay? FERC Guitars, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Guitar Geeks, unite, and we will see you next month. Thanks for watching, guys. Tony, back. Huge thanks to Brendan at Heartbreaker Guitars for sharing that information with us. To learn more about Fur Guitars and Heartbreaker Guitars, to look at their showroom, which you must do, and you can do that from the comfort of your own home, just visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT136. You'll be able to see links to Fur Guitars as well as Heartbreaker Guitars. And I think we all now know that Toby's favorite part of the chair is the upper right corner of the backrest because he was just gnawing on that thing. Uh, but again, huge thanks to Brendan and Toby and all the Heartbreaker uh, crew. Uh, what a fantastic bunch of guitar geeks over there. And they got some stellar guitars for sure. Now I wanna go back in our time machine and visit episode 134, where we focused on the Gibson Hummingbird. I wanna take a look at a few comments from that show. Our first one comes from Wiggo Carlson, and he says this. 
Thanks, Tony, for dedicating an entire Acoustic Tuesday to the H-Bird. I'm happy to have owned one, a 2012 Honeyburst. It was probably the best looking guitar in my entire collection, along with my two Ibanez Doves from 75 and 77 lawsuit models. I bought the 77 brand new way back then and have kept it ever since. I have, however, handed the Gibson HB over to my son. He's a far better guitar player than I've ever been, and he really deserves that bird. A very cool little kind of, uh, uh, well, we can even call that a moment of guitar gratitude. It's so cool when that, that passing of guitars happens and the, the sharing of a passion happens, uh, as I mentioned in my guitar gratitude. Uh, such, a, such a cool moment. So thank you for leaving that comment. Our next one comes from Dakota Drummer 2, and he says this. Wow, that's you without long hair and a beard? I wouldn't recognize you at all. Your show is fantastic, and it brings me a sense of calm and normalcy during this time. Well, thanks so much for watching. And yes, uh, some of my old guitar reviews, in fact, Colorado Kyle and I were laughing last week. Um, I look like a completely different person. Whitney often brings those up and shows me them at home and says, I can't believe this was you. And she's trying to encourage me to shave my beard. It's not in the cards. I told her that's not gonna happen, but uh, I applaud her efforts greatly. Uh, moving on to our next comment from Mark D. He says this, great stuff, Tony, well done, thank you. I have a bird, luckily enough. Got it last year, amazing. Having said that, luckier still, I also have a 2017 SJ200 and it's even more amazing. Needless to say, I'm still on bread and water and will be for a while. But both these guitars are extra special and more than worth it, if at all possible possible. Love your show. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you so much, Mark. And it sounds like you got quite a guitar arsenal uh, at your fingertips there. So, so cool you have a chance to spend some time with such awesome guitars. Next, let's move to a comment from Jim Horse. And he says this, Tony commented on how Keith Richards played a hummingbird. I dug out my Rolling Stones anthology, volume one songbook, circa 1975. And sure enough, a younger, fresh looking Keith played one not in one, but three black and white photos. Lots of great old songs encapsulated in there as well. Glad I took it off the shelf. Well, I'm glad the show inspired you to do that, not only for the guitar geek uh, uh, pictures, I almost said footage, but for digging into some of those classic songs. So very cool, Jim, thank you for that comment. Next up, we've got Sheriff Dave, David W. Uh, he says, greetings from Sheriff Dave, Tony. After watching this episode of Acoustic Tuesday, I feel better about owning my hummingbirds and my doves in flight guitars, and not so much remorse about not owning a Martin. I still would like to have a Martin someday though. Great show. Uh, thanks so much, Sheriff Dave, and I'm glad you checked in with the show. Uh, Sheriff Dave, I had the pleasure of meeting in person at the very first Acoustic Life Festival, then known as the Tony's Acoustic Challenge Jamboree. And man, he, he showed me pictures of a guitar case that he actually built for his hummingbirds and his doves in flight. And uh, man, what an awesome guitar geek. And I, I got to see and witness a moment of, of Sheriff Dave stepping on stage and playing with the band, playing open mic for his first time. Uh, it was a magical moment. So, uh, so cool to see that comment come across the board there. Thank you so much, Sheriff Dave, and I hope you are doing well. All right, well, I just wanna thank everyone for your comments back on episode 134. Lots of chatter about Gibson hummingbirds, some great stories. And I just mentioned one single line from Young Frankenstein. I simply said, Abby Normal. And you all just hopped right on it. In fact, there's a whole thread on the comments on episode 134 of Young Frankenstein quotes and some overall lots of love for Young Frankenstein. So just in general, thank you all of you guitar, thank all of you guitar geeks for uh, the wonderful comments and participating in such an awesome discussion. I love the community that's created during the Acoustic Tuesday show and in the comments kind of carrying out the conversation and overall just being guitar geeks and, and chatting with our fellow guitar geeks. It's pretty darn awesome. So thank you so much. All right, moving right along, I do want you to know you can support the Acoustic Tuesday show by visiting AcousticTuesday.store. While you're there, why don't you pick yourself up a Guitar Arsenal shirt? I'd love to bring the Guitar Arsenals back. In fact, when you go to AcousticTuesday.store, find the Guitar Arsenal shirt. Purchase yourself a Guitar Arsenal shirt, and once you get it, go ahead and put it on. Take a picture in front of all of your guitars, your entire guitar collection. Yes, it might take some time, but I want you to do it. I can assure you it is worth it. Because after you take that picture, you could submit it at AcousticLife.tv. There's a submit link in the top menu, click on it, 
You can upload your picture, and then I want you to name all your guitars, what's in your collection, and I'll feature you on an upcoming episode of Acoustic Tuesday, and I'll double that on Instagram at tac.guitar, so you can check that out and share it with your guitar geek friends, but don't let your spouse see it. It may give them reason to say that you don't need another guitar. However, when they see the smile on your face in your guitar snow picture, they can counterbalance that and say, well, all these guitars do bring them pleasure, so I guess it's okay. I guess it's okay, one more is just fine, but only one more. You know that discussion, I don't have to, I don't have to beat that dead horse. All right, before we get into our final moment here where we're gonna go through the wheel of guitar improvement, that's coming up in a second. I'm gonna actually walk you through that. First, let's visit the mailbag. Now, I don't have anything to share with you per se that has arrived, but I've got some things in transit. Uh, during times like these, you know, when we're stuck inside the house and we're trying to be guitar geeks and we're trying to be good stewards of the acoustic life, there's one thing you can do and that I wanna urge you to do. In fact, I've got a little personal story I wanna share with you. I want you to support your favorite artists. This could be a local artist, a national artist, it doesn't matter, but visit them online, check out their website. If they're doing an online concert, attend. Just simply go there and watch and be, be a part of that moment because there's been so many cool online concerts, so many cool Facebook lives, Instagram lives, other social media lives. Uh, it's really a great time to be able to sit at home and watch some of your favorite artists still play live. And I wanna thank all the artists that are doing that. I think that's, it's, a, it's kind of a tall order and it's a little bizarre to be alone at home playing a show to you know quite possibly hundreds of people that aren't in the same room. But it's darn cool to see uh, such solidarity in the uh, acoustic music world right now. And uh, on that, I wanted to make a comment because just last week I was talking to Whitney and I was like, you know, one of the things I wanna do is support the artists that we know and love and do so as best we can. So we've committed to picking one artist per day of the week and supporting them however we can, whether that's visiting an online show or purchasing some merchandise or something to that effect. So I just wanna run down some of the artists that we've chose to support so far, and this by no means is a complete list, but I just wanna give you an idea of just the little things that you can do that can help out your fellow acoustic artists during this time. Um, well, the first one's not even acoustic, but I wanted to mention it because I'm really excited. I pre-ordered the new Lamb of God album, and I got the hoodie, and I got the deluxe vinyl, and I'm really excited. So that's that's the first artist we decided to support. Uh, next, uh, Dead Horses. Uh, we got their EP in addition to some really cool, they got this great t-shirt with this the birds in the background. You gotta check out their website. Dead Horses are awesome, and uh, just, just love those guys. And uh, so we decided to support them. And then, of course, uh, who would I? I'd be if I didn't support Molly Tuttle. She just launched uh, some new merchandise, some great t-shirt designs, and she's also got some really cool enamel pins, if that's your thing, on her website. So thanks, Molly Tuttle, for uh, putting out not only great music, but really cool merch so we can, so us guitar geeks can kind of support as best we can. And then I want to mention uh, Tony Furtado, who not only makes amazing music and he's doing some great online concerts, but he's an incredible sculptor. And his Etsy account, uh, he has some great sculptures that are available. So Whitney and I decided to add another rabbit sculpture to our to our midst. And then I want to mention uh, another non-musical artist, but somebody who we greatly admire, somebody who did uh, this tattoo of mine, uh, Marie Senna. And she's down in Dallas, Texas. She works at Electric Eye Studio. We ordered some art from her. And then lastly, Billy Strings, who has some really cool t-shirts and a great hat. I've newly become a hat person, uh, thanks to Colorado Kyle. And I found a great hat on Billy Strings website, so I wanted to order that. He's also got some great stuff from, um, I believe, last winter that's on sale. Some really cool shirts and whatnot. So support your favorite artists when you can. And if it's not a monetary thing, just show them some love on the social media. Like their posts or, like I said, attend those online concerts because it, be, it can be kind of a weird feeling as a performer, not performing to an actual crowd, but a, a virtual crowd. So uh, do what you can uh, during this time as a, as a guitar geek. So show support when and where you can. All right, moving on. We're about ready. We're real close to wrapping the show, but there's something very important I want to walk you through, and that is... Well, let me just first kick this off by stating a problem that all of us guitar geeks run into at one time or another. You play, you practice regularly, and then at one point you wonder, you think, God, am I getting any better? I've, I mean, I've been playing so much, but 
Am I, am I actually improving? I don't know. You kind of lose sight with your guitar journey because you're in it day in and day out. Well, I wanna show you something that will help you evaluate where you are and where you're going. Essentially, evaluate how well you're doing in certain categories and recognize areas for improvement. This is something that will help out any guitar geek, whether you're just starting playing, whether you've played for a long time, or whether you're coming back to it after uh, uh, some time away. Um, and it's called the Wheel of Guitar Improvement. Now this is something that I want to walk you through right now. Don't worry if you don't have it on hand, you can take some notes or you can visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT136 and actually download your own wheel of guitar improvement that I affectionately call the Wogie. It's a chance for us to look at different categories and evaluate how we're doing, recognize areas for improvement and then chart a path forward so we do know that we're working towards progress. Now. What is the Wogi? Well, the Wogi is a way that you can rate yourself in certain categories. This scale is one through five. One being, I need some work in this, ad this category, and five being, man, I feel super confident and great in this category. So we're gonna go ahead and walk through this very briefly, but I would encourage you to visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT136 and do, uh, do really kind of put your head down and think about these categories. So the first category in the 12 o'clock position is accuracy. How accurately do you play the guitar? Do you hit chords when you wanna hit chords? Do your fingers land in the right spot? Are your chords clear? Are they consistent? Or do you have some buzziness? Do you feel like sometimes your fingers do whatever the hell they want, even though you want them to do something that's not what they're doing? Go ahead and rate yourself one through five. I'm gonna give myself a three. I just uh, played something this morning and I thought, wow, I thought I was more accurate than I am, uh, but apparently I'm not. Now, as you're rating yourself on this particular, uh, uh, on any of these categories, I don't want you to compare yourself to other guitar players. This is solely you and how confident you feel in each of these categories. The comparison mindset is can be a scary one because you think, man, I'm just, I'm not so good. I don't want you comparing yourself to your friends or even guitar players that you look up to. How confident do you feel in your guitar journey in each of these categories? Let's continue on going clockwise through this uh, wogi. And the next is finger strength. And a great way to measure this is, you know, do bar chords leave your hands feeling cramped and kind of uncomfortable after a while? Or do you feel like you can hold a bar chord down pretty strong and pretty solid and feel like it sounds good all the time? Go ahead and rate yourself one through five. I'm gonna give my a four on that one because I feel like my hands are and fingers are pretty darn strong. Next up, we got speed. This isn't simply how fast can you play. This is how can you how accurately can you maintain tempo at a tempo that's challenging to you. For some, that might be 60 beats per minute. For others, it might be 160 beats per minute. Remember, we're not comparing ourselves to other guitar players here. We're actually thinking about our own guitar journey and how comfortable we feel at a speed that's challenging to us. How accurately can we maintain it? Um, I feel pretty good in this. I'm gonna go ahead and give myself a four on this one as well. Next up, frequency of playing with others. This might be a tough one to measure at this time, but how often do you play with others? Do you, and this could be, you know, if we're taking a virtual stab at this, do you check out backing tracks online and do you play with those? Do you play on a virtual jam via Skype or do you do Skype lessons? How often do you play with maybe members of your family? And think of, you know, if it's not too often, that's a one. If it's semi-regularly, that's a three. And if it's all the time, well, of course, that's a five. I'm gonna go ahead and give myself a three. I've definitely been in more of a practice mindset lately and, and less of a jam mindset. So I'll give myself a three in that category. Uh, next up, consistent practice schedule. This is how often do you sit down and play the guitar for at least 10 minutes a day at the same time and at the same place? How regular is your playing habit? And right now, I will say this, since I'm trapped inside, I'm gonna give myself a five. It's been pretty darn regular and I feel pretty awesome about it. Uh, next up, improvisation. How comfortable are you if somebody's playing rhythm guitar, whether it be a backing track online or somebody in person, how comfortable are you actually attempting a solo over that? Don't think about the results of the solo, but how comfortable are you with that idea? playing a solo, improvising. I'm gonna give myself a four, definitely room for improvement for me, but um, go ahead and judge yourself accordingly. One through five, one being needs work, five being, ah, uh, I feel pretty darn confident. Next up, song repertoire. How many songs do you know? Now, a great way to answer this and measure yourself is if somebody asks you to play a song, can you think of one right now and play it start to finish, or does it take a second? And if they kept asking you to play songs, how deep into the night would you be able to go? Would you kind of tap out at four songs or would you be able to keep going? Uh, go ahead and rate yourself accordingly. I feel like I have a pretty deep song repertoire, but 
it's certainly not as deep as I would like it to be. I'm gonna knock myself, I'm gonna give myself a three. Not knock myself down, but I just definitely want to improve in that particular category. And then lastly, fretboard knowledge. When you look at your guitar neck, is it a sea of confusing frets, especially past fret, you know, three or five? Or do you feel pretty confident that you know where you are? Do you feel confident on how to make a scale? Do you feel confident on movable chords and how to name them? If you feel confident, go ahead and rate yourself a five. If you feel not so confident, move yourself more towards the one, two, three area. Uh, I feel pretty good. Uh, I'm gonna give myself a four on that. Once you've got your dots plotted on the wheel of guitar improvement, go ahead and connect them as best you can. Now, ideally we want a circle. We want like a, a wheel that we could drive on, but mine looks more like a home plate or maybe Africa or maybe a, a spaceship of sorts. And that's okay because those areas that you feel like you didn't rate so well in, those are areas where you can improve. And those areas where you feel like, man, I'm pretty confident, those are, th that's cause for celebration. That's a small win right in front of you, right there. Now, the reason I'm doing this right now is it's March. Yes, it's month, month three, in fact, the end of the third month of 2020. And I want you to do this on a three month rhythm. Why? Because so often we lose sight of where we've come from on the guitar or what we've achieved. And this Wogie, this Wheel of Guitar Improvement is your chance to just take pause and reflect. What have I been working on? Have I been doing a pretty good job? Did any of these things change? Now this, this wheel, your ratings, they're gonna fluctuate from time to time because remember, we're not comparing yourself. You're just gonna rate yourself on how you feel in your guitar journey. And again, I want you to do this on kind of a three month rhythm. This is exactly what we do within Tony's Acoustic Challenge, but I wanted to share it with everybody watching the Acoustic Tuesday show because I think it's really beneficial to have hard evidence of your progress areas that you can improve in, but also areas that you have already improved in. So again, that's the Wheel of Guitar Improvement. To download yours today, please visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT136. You'll be able to download this, print it out, and start your, uh, start your charting of your progress. I think you'll find it a great kind of refreshing exercise because it, it does allow you to take pause and look back and say, oh, I am getting better. It's kind of a peace of mind in a way because so often we don't we don't reflect and we don't evaluate. So we just keep chasing, we just keep chasing, we just keep chasing. We don't look back and say, man, I am progressing. I, am, I can celebrate some of those small ones and it feels darn good. So again, acousticlife.tv forward slash AT136 to get access to your Wogi today. You can print out as many copies as you need. You'll only need one, two, three. Well, you only need four per year if you wanna do it on that three month rhythm. So there you have it. Now, one thing that I have not forgotten about, and I'm sure you haven't either, is your Guitar Geek trivia question. So I wanna wrap up today's show with an awesome tale of guitar mythology, if you will, but let me first remind you of what the question was, and it has everything to do with Tony Rice, his guitar, and when he became the owner of his now infamous 1935 Martin D28. Here was your question. In which year did Tony Rice become the owner of the now infamous 1935 Martin D28 that had once been owned by Clarence White. Well, your options were 1958, 1964, 1968, or 1975. If you answer D, 1975, you're 100% correct. Now I'm gonna read you the answer. This was pulled from the Fretboard Journal when they did kind of an expose on Tony Rice's guitar. So uh, I'll be reading some quotes from Tony Rice. So here is the story on how Tony Rice came to be the owner of Clarence White's 1935 Martin D28. One day in 1975, Bobby Rice and, uh, not Bobby Rice, Tony Rice and Bobby Sloan got to talking about Clarence White. And Tony says this, Bobby told me the story of why Clarence had given the herringbone up to Joe Miller. And he started telling me more and more about Joe Miller and who he was. I guess he used to play football for UCLA. His family owned a chain of liquor stores in Pasadena. So Tony began to think, I'd never met this guy, but Joe Miller just might be willing to let this thing go. Here's where it gets really, really weird. Tony Rice is living in Kentucky at the time and he gets a phone call and uh, he, he gets on the phone and calls information for Pasadena, California for a listing of Miller's Liquor. And they go, yeah, we got about 20 of them. Which one do you want? So Tony rolls his eyes and laughs ruefully at the memory. He said, give me the first one on there. So I called that first number and I said, I'm looking for Joe Miller. The guy on the phone said, no, Joe ain't here right now, but he'll be back in about two hours. 
I called back and I talked to Joe. I said, Joe, this is Tony Rice. Do you know who I am? And he said that he did. I asked him if he had Clarence's guitar and he said, yes, I sure do. It's been under my bed for nine years. It hasn't been touched. I said, would you consider getting rid of it? He said, yeah, to you, I would. This was in 1975, Rice continues. So here I am thinking Joe Miller knows what he's got. I'm gonna have to go down to the bank and talk a banker into loaning me some enormous amount of money, thousands and thousands to get this guitar. Sure enough, its owner, insisted, its owner insisted on having the Martin appraised by a professional before he'd name his price. Rice agreed to the plan and the two men arranged to speak on the phone the very next day. That afternoon, Miller brought the Martin to a nearby violin shop, which, check this out, as it turned out, was also the last place that Clarence White had it worked on. The man at the violin shop suggested that it was worth less than one might have expected given its present state. It, apparently it wasn't very playable at the time. In fact, Tony later uh, goes on to say that the action was about as high as a dobro. <laughs> According to Rice, Joe Miller called back and said, I'll take five or six hundred dollars for it. To that, Tony Rice said, tell you what, I'll split the difference, I'll give you $550. The deal was later conducted at what better place, the LAX airport. Yes, Tony Rice paid $550 for that 1935 Martin D28 that is now, I would say, priceless, and certainly lives in the hall of fame of iconic guitars in the acoustic music world. Pretty awesome tale, and pretty great way to wrap up this episode of Acoustic Tuesday. I wanna thank you for sharing your time with me today, but we should also, we should take a sneak peek into next week. I got, I, got, I got information coming into my mind. I'm a little bit of a clairvoyant these days. And hold on, yep, okay, no, totally, no, no Big Mac, oh yeah, yes. Okay, so next week on Acoustic Tuesday, it's the heavyweight battle of all time. It's a battle for the ages. It is a battle indeed of two of the biggest guitar manufacturers in the acoustic guitar world. In this corner, we've got Martin guitars. In this corner, we've got Taylor guitars. Next week on Acoustic Tuesday, it's gonna be Martin versus Taylor, and I will give you which one I think wins the battle. A definitive answer. No, I'm not gonna play down the middle on this one. I'm gonna commit, but you gotta tune in next week to find out who I love more, Martin or Taylor. It's gonna be a battle for the ages and I want you to be there. Remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time here on YouTube. For your Acoustic Tuesday fix in between Tuesdays, please visit AcousticLife.tv and please don't forget to follow us on Instagram at tac.guitar. There's a lot of goodness going on there as well. So thank you again for sharing your time with me today and thank you so much for being a guitar geek. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. I have great gratitude for you being a guitar geek and remember, guitar geeks unite. I'll see you next Tuesday on Acoustic Tuesday. Cheers. Thank you.